My name is Stefan Harmon. I'm a PA, and tonight I'm giving the lecture on iodine for chronic disease prevention and management. I've given this lecture a couple of times now. It's been a fan favorite uh, because iodine we've identified as an underutilized modality, and it's a real one we should be aware of because it's an epidemic of deficiency. Iodine deficiency is as rampant as vitamin D deficiency. I've tested quite a few patients at my practice in serum and urinary analysis. In the serum, you can get this pretty done cheaply, 40 bucks at LabCorp, and you'll get a serum level of iodine, which really that just tells you if you've taken iodine in the previous day. Not a great test, but it can prove it to you, your, your own, you know, your clinical judgment to prove it that is uh, deficient in your population. So you can see here, most patients are at or below the reference range. So the reference range is 40 to 100 per lab core. Uh, and you can see here a couple examples, patients at 41, 45. Um, athletes I find are lower than most. So athletes will be as low as like 28. Uh, there were some bodybuilders here that were quite low as well. Uh, overweight patients, uh, fatigue patients, kind of the typical picture we'd see in hypothyroidism. They also have very low iodine. Uh, so everyone here is low. Uh, and you will only have high iodine serum if you take iodine, not just the multivitamin, you know, the 250 micrograms that's in your multivitamin. We're talking milligrams, so between 3 and 11 milligrams, and then you'll start to finally see it in the serum. So this was uh, a couple of patients like myself. I was taking three drops of a 2% Lugol's iodine, and I got up to 180. Um, I like the iodine challenge test a little bit better for assessing iodine deficiency. This is even by WHO standards. If it's less than a 0.1 um, on the, on the, on any urinary test, whether it's a random um, or pre-test, even by WHO standards, that is deficiency, right? And we see pretty routinely, I've seen in iodine testing is people are at that, even that WHO cutoff of pre-test deficiency. But what this test does is you take 50 milligrams of iodine bef uh, before the test. You give a sample in the morning, you capture your pee, and then you put it in a tube, and then you do the pretest. You take 50 milligrams of iodine, and over the next 24 hours, you capture all of your urine in this big orange container that you see here on the screen. You shake it up at the end of the test, you put it in the second test tube, and you ship it off to the lab, such as doctor's data. And they give you an assessment of your excretion rates, right? We'll talk a little bit more, and we'll give you some uh, examples of what the excretion rates are. Let's go here. Now, you guys, after listening to this lecture, you're going to learn the power of iodine and how you can be a hero to your patients um, and how you can rapidly reverse diseases and improve symptoms by giving them iodine. We see this at Iron Direct Primary Care every day. Today, I just saw about six patients as follow ups, and every single one of them felt better by taking a basic supplementation protocol of iodine, some B vitamins, selenium, um, and vitamin D. It's very simple to improve patients with this modality. So let's get into a little bit of why we might want to do this. One is the cancer prevention and iodine. So there's, I always tell my patients, there's about five iodine sensitive organs that you guys can learn about today. It is thyroid, obviously, that's an iodine dependent organ, we all know that, but the lesser known ones our breast, um, ovaries, uterus, and the prostate. All of these are iodine sensitive organs. And in deficiency, they will start getting growths and uh, pains and so forth. But with iodine replenishment, you will see a decrease in incidence of these diseases. And you'll see this in populations like the Japanese populations and Koreans, because they consume more iodine, which we'll see a little bit later. So I'll give you some examples here. We're going to do a lot of case studies because I got a whole lot of case studies. This is a 60-year-old female medical doctor. She has breast cancer, and she wanted an integrative approach. She didn't want to do conventional approach. So part of that process for her was obtaining this test from me. And we did the iodine challenge test, and lo and behold, she is quite deficient. But not only that, she also has a bit of bromide toxicity. So her bromide in the excretion sample um, showed about 6.5 milligrams, where the reference range is below seven. So this poor lady, she's living with a bit of bromide in her body, 
And only by taking 50 milligrams of iodine is she able to express this bromide. And we'll get into why that might happen a little bit later. Iodine is an element on the periodic table, as you all very well know. Uh, it was isolated in 1811 from the ash of seaweed. Of course, seaweed is full of iodine. Uh, the Greeks understood this. Uh, they call it is uh, iodes, meaning violet color. Uh, iodide was used as a remedy for goiter, Derbyshire neck back in the 1800s. And then it was added to the salts because back in those days, goiter was a real big problem. So they added iodine to the salt to prevent the goiter. And I was taught in school that goiter doesn't happen anymore. I don't need to worry about that, which we're not, is not true. And we'll see that very shortly. So here's another case example. This is a breast pain case, 12 year old girl, she's plenty of breast pain. I advised her to paint a Lugol's iodine. This is a liquid iodine onto the breast daily. And the symptoms rapidly resolved within about three days. Uh, and this is not an uncommon uh, finding I see uh, in the in the blood, a low vitamin D, a low iodine, because you know, people are not aware of this. So again, here's the that picture that we all saw in our training, whether it's a PA training or MD training. You saw this picture of uh, an African uh, person, and they had a big neck, and they said, this is a goiter, but this doesn't happen. You will never see this in practice because you're in a first world country. This is a patient of mine locally who had a, uh, ultrasound done of the neck because you know he thought he had cancer. I looked, took one look at his neck. I said, buddy, you don't have cancer. You have a goiter. And I had to prove it to him with the ultrasound. So we now have him on high dose iodine therapy and uh, this patient is getting better. We're going to repeat the ultrasound in a couple months after we saturate his body with iodine and we're going to see his goiter shrink. Uh, so there's the other reasons why we might want to be doing iodine other than the obvious goiter. Autism and cognitive disorders. So there's a potential relationship between an iodine deficiency and these behavioral and cognitive uh, problems that we are seeing more often. Again, I was taught in school that this was cretinism, and this is something that only developing countries have a problem with, is low IQ children. But we see this more and more often now is behavioral cognitive issues in children, and uh, the iodine deficiency affects children. Uh, as much as adults, if not more. So one thing we have to recognize, now this is for Dr. Halasa, who really likes mechanism of action. What you will see when you start putting your patients on iodine is you will get a TSH increase. Now, why does this happen? Well, it's because your body is finally getting back the nutrients that it needs to produce the thyroid hormone. So do not be alarmed when you give your patient iodine and selenium and the TSH goes up. This is a good thing. This means that their body is finally getting the substrate that it needs to produce thyroid hormone. So we do not dose anything off of a TSH. And everyone here at A4M and uh, Clearfields Group knows this. This is a 30-year-old female patient with recurrent infectious cyst formations and elevated IGF-1. And she is now doing a Lugol's iodine. And we are now finally seeing her IGF-1 go down to 296. It previously um, had been with 300s consistently above 300s. And she was having recurrent infections, cystic uh, growths, et cetera. Um, she's getting these tonsillar abscesses. And if we go back to some of the mechanism of why this might be going on, when you give back iodine, there's a negative feedback loop with the pituitary and the pituitary will calm down and uh, you will see a lowering of the IGF-1. So not only the thyroid needs this, uh, but your pituitary will respond to iodine as well. So why isn't iodine recommended more often by mainstream medicine and even us here at A4M? I have actually never heard it once mentioned at any of the A4M conferences I've been to. And patients will always ask me, is it safe in pregnancy? Is it safe in children? Well, let's talk about that. Placental tissue iodine levels and blood magnesium concentration in preeclamptic and normal pregnancy. What they identified here is that the placenta of the female patient that had the preeclampsia, meaning the high blood pressure in pregnancy, a very dangerous condition, was an iodine deficient placenta. Thus, uh, you need to give women. Uh, pregnant women, ideally before pregnancy, iodine. Because magnesium 
assimilation is known to be defective when iodine levels are insufficient. So perhaps the preeclampsia isn't so much a magnesium deficiency. We all know the treatment for preeclampsia, you give them IV magnesium. But perhaps we could prevent the entire emergency situation if we gave these women iodine and did not have uh, the medical iodophobia so much on the iodine. So this is the patient, another case example. She uh, had been struggling with hormonal imbalance. I hear this so often. Uh, you know, difficult cycles, painful cycles, random cycles, uh, um, you know, what we call premenstrual dysphoria, these names that we give for women with crying and so forth associated with their periods. Uh, and she also had very difficult with the weight loss. So we give this lady iodine. We gave her, started 25 milligrams of iodine. And she rapidly started noticing that her weight was coming off uh, quicker than we would expect. She didn't change any of her variables and the weight is coming off. Um, I would assume this would be because she's losing perhaps like some water weight. She's losing some of the estrogen dominance. Uh, she's, she's moving this out of her system some a uh, little bit better and her hormones are stabilizing. And we see this pretty routinely, these stories. Here's a bit more on the placental tissue iodine levels and the blood magnesium concentration in preeclamptic women. The study is the first to report lower placental tissue iodine levels in women with severe preeclampsia than in healthy women. Okay, I think we understand that now. So we're going to go on to other diseases that we're going to optimize with iodine, right? And these will learn our breast, uh, thyroid, ovarian, prostate, uh, anything from fibromyalgia, chronic pain, fatigue, and of course, the hypothyroidism. Let's talk about this. Now, Dr. Kathleen Reddy got me onto this one. This is the mouse mammary tumor that infects human uh, cells. And Dr. Kathleen Reddy wrote the book on this. Actually, you might want to read that at some point. But she suggests that selenium is anti-cancer in that it is an antiviral for this specific um, um, virus and tumor and iodine is also critical for preventing uh, this carcinoma this memory carcinoma uh, so this is a really cool study done uh, by cell and tumor biology in 2005 iodine has long been known to maintain the normal physiology of thyroid and breast tissue molecular iodine has been found uh, effective in diminishing mammary dysplasia and atypia resulting from iodine deficiency symptoms of mammary fibrosis in women and occurrence of chemically induced mammary cancer in rats. So this is pretty powerful news. I was recently at a lecture with the board certified um, breast cancer surgeons and I asked them if they understood or knew any literature to suggest that iodine can play any role in the prevention or even treatment of breast cancer and they said, where is your evidence for this? Uh, this, this is not evidence based. And like, well, there is plenty of evidence. We just need to look for this. So here is what we saw in school, the cretinistic child. They look like this. And again, I was told, I don't need to worry about that. I'm, I'm going to work in the US. But um, I would suggest that we look for this in children. We screen them for iodine deficiency. And you will rapidly see that their grades get better in school and their behavioral issues are improving. Let's talk about the fibrocystic breast disease. So this is a woman, uh, specifically a young woman with painful breasts, but it can happen at older ages too. So this is a study showing that if you give women back iodine, their fibrocystic breast disease improves rather rapidly. And I've seen this in clinical practice a lot, but we have this old study that I pulled up in a PDF to support this done by William Ghent um, a long time ago. And this was done on 4,000 patient, uh, over 4,000 patient years. We know what that means. And they were using 2% Lugol's iodine. This is a very cheap solution. You can get on on Amazon.com. 70% of the patients improved softening of the breast tissue and mammogram improvements in the breast density. And we all understand that a mammogram with a dense breast is one, is dangerous because you cannot detect the tumor. It may be hidden. And then two, the fibrocystic breast disease itself is a risk factor for, de for developing a carcinoma. And of course, mild side effects from iodine might be uh, a bit of acne. Um, and I've seen that in real-time practice as well. I believe that's a detox reaction. 
This is a patient who got a thermography done and was very scared and came to me. So thermography will also clue you in. You'll get patients, they'll get thermography done whether you order it or not, but they'll come to you with these tests and they say, doc, what am I gonna do? Well, if you look at the thermography scan, it will often say, okay, this is an estrogen dominance and you should probably look for iodine deficiency if you read the fine print in every thermography scan, right? So we did the iodine challenge test for this lady and she had a, um, a significant deficiency. You identify a deficiency in these tests. After you give them 50 milligrams of iodine, you determine what dose they need or how much they held on to. So this lady, after 50 milligrams of iodine, she excreted uh, 30 milligrams of it. So that means she held on to 20 milligrams of iodine because the body is intelligent and it knows it needs that much. So she held on to that much. So we're giving this lady higher doses of iodine and she will repeat thermography or do an um, mammo, uh, mammogram to observe the improvement in the fibrocystic breast disease because uh, that's what she was having. This is a patient with mastitis. So again, we talked about risk and a breastfeeding woman do this. This is a woman, 43 year old breastfeeding newborn. She saw me because she had a mastitis, clear as day mastitis. And this was back when I wasn't a believer in iodine. And I was like, listen, I know the treatment, I learned this in school, it's ampicillin, 500 milligram capsules, we're gonna take this, I'm gonna, I prescribe this to her. I said, listen, there's this voodoo you can do, you can put a little bit of topical leucose iodine, uh, it, it can't hurt, but you can see what happened. She said, ah, the mastitis went away, I threw out the ampicillin, I didn't need to take it. So we all know from the COVID pandemic, Dr. Peter McCullough identified that intranasal iodine is antiviral. So it decreases your viral burden when you're breathing it in and it kills the viral particles on contact. Uh, so it's a very cheap and simple uh, way to treat diseases. Surgeons have used iodine topically for hundreds of years uh, prior to incisions, right? So we know it's antimicrobial too. We can use it to treat um, infections. And the, the uh, farmers know this as well. Right? The farmers know that the cow deficient in iodine will get the mastitis. But also, they know that the cows deficient in iodine and selenium will get ovarian cysts. So we can learn something from our farmers, our Japanese farmers in this case. You give the cows iodine. Why can't we do that in humans too, who develop cysts in the ovaries? So we do this, and we see patients improve. This is a 34 year old female and we're giving her 50 milligrams of iodine. And this is because she had ovarian cysts. She reported to me, I've had zero side effects and have lost almost 10 pounds. I'm sleeping better and I'm less fatigued all the time. She previously uh, was uh, noting that uh, the week immediately following period is only the time the patient can sleep through the night. Last three weeks of cycle, she will wake up at 2 a.m. However, once she started iodine, she finally slept through the night, which was groundbreaking for her. So the mammary gland has only a temporary ability to concentrate iodides almost exclusively during pregnancy and lactation, which are considered protective conditions against breast cancer. Wow. So when the breast has more iodine in there, it's protective against cancer. But these are times when the woman needs even more iodine because she's trying to give it to the child to grow the child's brain and give it higher IQ and make sure it's not a cretinistic child. So she's giving away her iodine to the child right, in her breast tissue, in her breast milk. So this is a pregnant woman. She needs more iodine. And then we can assume that if we give these iodine to the women, we can decrease the risk of cancer. So this is a patient 64 years old on hormone replacement therapy, estradiol, TRT, progesterone. We started this for her and she noticed the breast tenderness. And some of you docs out there, uh, maybe you reduce the dose or you say, ah, it'll go away. But this is a warning sign that maybe she is estrogen dominant. She is accumulating too much estrogen in the breast. She is not processing it correctly. We give this woman back iodine and lo and behold, the the tenderness went away. Numerous studies have demonstrated that while iodide is metabolically more effective in the thyroid gland, iodine is more active in the breast. Furthermore, iodine is required to maintain normal physiologic homeostasis and increase iodine uptake by the breast 
is critical during lactation. Normal breast function requires, at time, increased iodine uptake, which is likely hormone-mediated. The relationship between iodine and estrogen metabolism also involves iodine affecting estrogen signals in the breast independent of the thyroid. For example, iodine diminishes dysplasia in clinical trials and breast tumor growth in rats more effectively than iodide. Well, you need both. You need both iodine and iodide. That's why the leucal solution is so important or the iodorol solution is so important because it has both. The present results demonstrate again that there's a relationship between estrogen status and iodine excretion and suggest that there is a threshold for iodine required for maintenance of normal breast function in premenopausal women. I would say also the postmenopausal in hormone replacement. Thus, urine iodine levels may be useful in breast cancer risk assessment among these patients. So this is very important for you, Dr. Halasa, to add to your book. If you're talking about estrogen dominance, we need to be talking about iodine because the two cannot be discussed without the other. So iodine requirements of the breast is great, especially for the developing female. And this is true. Many, even my sister had this problem, um, you know, painful periods, uh, breast tenderness, was readily rectified with the topical lugals and oral lugals. This is a patient, she's 34 year old. She had ovarian cysts and chronic pain. We advised the patient to paint lugals iodine over the ovaries and the pain resolved. There's another uterine case, a 30 year old female with chronic uterine cramps, premenstrual dysphoria, history of goiter, colloidal cysts of thyroid at old primary. The primary never spoke about iodine. She's always had to take NSAIDs for the period pains. She's done now about three drops of 2% leucos iodine, and it's the first time she can remember she has no menstrual cramping, no dysphoria, and no NSAID use. So we're sparing her kidneys here from the ibuprofens. This was her urine halide testing. You see she is quite deficient here, even by WHO standards and a random iodine sa sampling, but she also has 44% excretion. That means that she's holding on to more than half of the iodine that we gave her in the 50 milligram dose. There is also some bromine, uh, minimal fluoride levels. So we get to the Japanese here. Why do they have less breast cancer in Japan? Why do they have less prostate cancer and uterine cancer? Is it because they're in this blue zone, this, this phenomena? Well, it's probably because they're eating a lot of seaweed. The Japanese consume between 3 and 12 milligrams of iodine per day in the form of seaweed. This is kombu, wakame, nori. Uh, these are things that my parents fed me when I was a child because they uh, they followed this diet called the macrobiotic diet. I don't recommend it for anyone, but it was high in seaweed at the very least. And uh, my mom, when she met my dad and she was in Germany at the time, because that's where my dad's from, he got her onto this diet and she she thought it was just the diet, but she was no longer experiencing these painful periods anymore. And in hindsight, looking back, she's like, we were consuming so much iodine at the time. And now that you're doing these lectures, Stefan, I understand that it was the seaweed and the iodine that got rid of the pain. We have a quiz for you all. Out of the halogens, which one is the most powerful oxidizing agent? Here's the periodic table. Let's go back to that. So here's the periodic table. We have fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Iodine is way down here on the periodic table. This means that it has less affinity towards binding to our tissues. We're exposed to all these every day. It's in our tap water. Um, we, 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 we're inundated with this. It's in our toothpaste. Our dentist tells us to use Listerine. So we are inundated with these chemicals. So that 150 micrograms in your Metagenics, you know, expensive multivitamin, you're like, oh, I'm getting iodine in here, Stefan. I don't need to worry about it. Is never stood a chance. It's never going to get where it needs to go. So in the study of chemistry, we know fluorine exists in the same column of iodine. And that means that it has more affinity towards binding to your tissues. Uh, we know that tap water has it. The Weston A. Price Foundation recommends against uh, drinking tap water because of this. Based on human and animal studies, we know that fluoride is harmful. Rat models demonstrate learning disability and generational consequences of high fluorine intake in water of 100 parts per million. Uh, this is indeed high. However, when we consider the cumulative dose of fluorine consumed in our food, water, and 
uh, we may be getting pretty toxic doses of this. And if you do the iodine challenge testing, you'll see that some patients will have milligrams of fluorine uh, coming out of them. A case control study of Iran looked at fluorine in tap water in humans. Cases tend to have higher TSH values. So that's no surprise. Uh, the thyroid will do be disrupted. And I'm sure you guys know this, but uh, the, um, the second most prescribed drug in the U.S. is the levothyroxine. It's a, a thyroid medicine. It's because everybody's TSH is elevated. Um, it's not because they're taking iodine. It's because they don't have enough. And their body is screaming to produce more thyroid hormone. And what do we do as good practitioners? We think we're smart and we give them natural desiccated thyroid hormone, uh, NP thyroid. We know what we're doing here. It's better than the conventional. Well, even better than the conventional is giving them back iodine and selenium. You give them back natural to make them produce their own thyroid hormone. And there's still some that still need uh, NP thyroid, but we can first cover our bases here and make sure they're maximized. So 30% of leading blockbuster drugs contain fluorine. This is pretty easy to assess for yourself. We've all done organic chemistry. All you have to do is you have to go to Google and you have to type in the name of your favorite pharmaceutical drug and you have to look at the organic chemistry and you will identify the fluorine atoms on the molecular structure. But here are some popular ones. Crestor may come to mind. Uh, Flonase, the intranasal, um, you know, anti-allergy drug. So you can breathe fluorine right into your brain, sniff it into your pineal gland, cause calcification of your pineal gland with fluoride, right? Not great. Fluoride causes difficulty breathing, nausea, vomiting, hives, headaches, weakness, stomach upset, and of course, uh, inhibiting your iodine absorption to the thyroid, inhibiting iodine absorption to your breast tissue, everywhere. And of course, we know the terrible ones, the ciprofloxacin, the fluoroquinolones, is literally in the name. They're telling you that they're poisoning you. Fluoro is, stands for fluoride. Uh, that's why they're called fluoroquinolones. And voriconazole, unfortunately. Fluoride as it relates to the diabetic, there's a large body of evidence of the harms associated with fluoride. This evidence is not widely known. Um, so I recommend, I can send this lecture to anyone later and they can look through all the, um, the harms related to fluoride if they're not convinced already. Um, let's see. Japanese culture on seaweed, here's a little bit more on that. Kind of talked about this. Uh, why children need iodine. So I get sometimes from my, my friends, uh, who say, why can't we, why do we need this? Our ancestors would never have had to take 12 milligrams of iodine for their life. I say, that's true. But our ancestors weren't brushing their teeth with Colgate toothpaste, right? So they weren't getting fluoride. They weren't drinking tap water. They weren't, you know, getting pesticides with bromide blown onto them every day. So we are polluted with all these toxic halogens. So we, in modern day humans, if we want to protect ourselves from cancer, thyroid disease, we need to be taking iodine. So the ancestral diet is deficient in iodine. So the meats really doesn't have that much iodine in there unless you're eating you know, shellfish and oysters, um, but those have some problems too. So we just uh, take iodine. We'll talk a little bit about bromide here. We've beaten fluoride to death. Uh, <laughs> This is a funny picture. Uh, this is I saw this in Florence when I was there. I took a picture of this guy. He had the buggy eyes. This is a lot of us in conventional and even holistic medicine think that iodine will cause uh, you know the graves, right? The, the the too high thyroid, the high iodine, and you see the big eyes. Um, I would say this is not the case for the most part, and this can happen, but it's. It's much more common to have hypothyroidism and the opposite rather than high thyroid. And something, of course, we monitor for, but not something we, we see very routinely. So this is um, a grim report by, card by uh, bromide in our bread products. In India, Brazil, Canada, uh, European Union, the uh, bromide is banned, but it's not banned in the U.S. Um, I think they recently banned it, though. I might get to that. So I have patients that say, well, Stefan, can't I get selenium from a natural source like Brazil nuts? Because if you type into Google, your patients will do this, high sources of selenium, they'll find Brazil nuts. But what the Google doesn't tell them is that 
the Brazil nuts are full of bromide too. They're just very good absorbers of these difficult elements. Um, and they may because the, the pesticide is full of bromide when they spray it on the Brazil nuts. So the Brazil nuts are absorbing all this bromide. And it's pretty toxic. So this was a 60-year-old male patient. And he was regularly consuming Brazil nuts because he thought, I'm going to get my selenium naturally. I don't need to take a supplement. This guy had 8.9 milligrams of a bromide in his urine after the iodine challenge test. I was like, well, buddy, we got to stop the Brazil nuts here. We're just going to take an eye, a selenium supplement. Bromide in bread. Um, so why did they do this? Well, it was an anti-caking agent that the bakers, the processed bread manufacturers would put in the dough to make it easier um, to mix. Um, and this was because of uh, medical iodophobia. I mean, it was, iodine was used in the bread products previously until someone at the AMA said, we need to get rid of iodine. It's too much for people. And so they started putting bromide in there, which is toxin. So, and it causes mesotheliomas and thyroid cell cancers in uh, rats. But, oh yes, as of November 2nd, the FDA finally proposed a ban on bromide. And it's found in a lot of the vegetable oils out there. The vegetable oils have their own problems. And all, only more reason not to drink these things is that they're full of bromide too. And it'll probably take a long time till bromide is out of the food circulation. So this is the 24-hour urinary test. It costs about 200 bucks. This is my testing here. This is me, Stefan. This is... Uh, I've been trying to correct my thyroid for some time here. I've had high TSHs even without taking iodine, and I've had low thyroid function. So I started taking three drops of Lugol's iodine, and I was able to improve my T4 from 2.4 to 2.9. And really, my thyroid peroxidase didn't really increase that much. I know some of you all are worried about TPO going up. My T4 is pretty good too, 1.28 to 1.6. I still need more T3. Um, here's my recent thyroid panel. I just got this done last month. Still, my TPO looks good. No thyroid peroxidase. Uh, my T3, 2.7. I actually went down, even though I'm now taking 12.5 milligrams of iodine. My TSH is still high, so I may eventually have to go on thyroid medicine. I don't really have a lot of the symptoms of it, but um, can't seem to fix it with iodine and selenium i'm going to keep giving it a good old try here and try to avoid getting myself on medication but i don't know we'll see hasn't fixed my thyroid um why am i to prescribe 50 milligrams of iodine to people oh there's a lot of reasons you can do it all right estrogen dominance growths uh, pains scoiters you give them iodine for a time 50 milligrams and it'll saturate their body and eventually you can lower it down to maybe a maintenance dose of six or 12 milligrams um and a fun fact if we ever got a nuclear war, you'd want to have some 50 milligram outerols in your cabinet because it's the natural antidote to a nuclear war. Fun fact. 25-year-old uh, female, post-birth control with new onset hypothyroidism, family history the same. She was progressively gained more and more weight. We kept increasing her NP thyroid dose, and she said, I'm still not feeling better. So we did the iodine challenge test. Uh, she has a fairly decent actually excretion 78 percent meaning that she only needs about uh 10 milligrams of iodine so she's pretty good she, and she's doing better already um after we gave her a bit of iodine so a little bit of iodine in addition to the np thyroid you can back off the dose of the thyroid medicine and they can do a lot better so this is a cheaper test uh it doesn't check the toxic halogens like bromide and fluoride you can get this done for about 100 bucks. This is a patient. She's a 40-year-old, 48-year-old female. She had chronic illness, mold sensitivity, fungal colonization in the nares. She had heavy exposure to toxins. She was a Navy shipbuilder, uh, chronic allergies, all sorts of things. This patient, um, she, she has a significant iodine deficiency. She held on to 50% of the iodine we gave her. So her dose is 25 milligrams a day. And we're going to monitor this patient for improvement over time. A little bit more on fluoride. So let's see. 67-year-old female. Uh, she had cancer in 1998, breast cancer. She had a lumpectomy, chemo, radiation. We assessed her iodine status. 
because she's been on NP thyroid for a, a while now. And so we know she's probably been iodine deficient for a long time. And lo and behold, she was. She has 60% excretion, indicating that she needs about 20 milligrams of iodine a day. She also had a bit of bromide ex uh, excretion and a little bit of fluoride too. So we're gonna start giving her iodine and she'll start feeling a little bit better. So I had a detox from halides. So if you remember that patient previously, he had about nine milligrams of bromide coming out of him. And he actually reported to me that he was feeling a little bit of kidney pain from this. All this toxic bromide was getting out of his body. So what I recommend for him, I say, drink more water, drink some electrolytes, you wanna flush out your kidneys. Then, as Brownstein would suggest, Dr. Brownstein, you wanna do some antioxidants. We all know about selenium. These patients on iodine need to be on selenium. About 150, 200 micrograms a day is plenty. You can get them on vitamin C. It's an antioxidant, up to six grams a day. And uh, Brownstein doesn't suggest this, but I would also suggest N-acetylcysteine, the NAC. Right? This is also an antioxidant. Dr. Halasa will also be happy to hear that I'm mentioning NAC. This can also help the patients um, lower their oxidative stress. This patient here showed a baseline test of 0.12, which even by WHO standards is a deficiency. Uh, this patient is holding on to about uh, let's see, 14 milligrams of what their dose needs. So this patient needs iodine too. We talked about this already. Let's go. Prostate cancer prevention with iodine. So in addition to the biological actions of iodine in regulating thyroid hormones, iodine has many additional functions, including anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and antimicrobial defense, which we talked about earlier. Iodine deficiency has been reported to be associated with increased cancer risk, including breast, thyroid, and prostate. Furthermore, iodine has been found to inhibit carcinogenic process in the breast and prostate cancer cell lines. These findings are consistent with results showing that incidence of prostate, endometrium, ovary, and breast cancer is lower in populations with high, higher iodine intake, such as the Japanese and Koreans, which we talked about earlier. So notably, this is the Republic of Iodine, uh, Ireland, not the Republic of Iodine. The Republic of Ireland has the highest cancer incidence in Europe, and the third highest in the world next to New Zealand and Austria. The majority of the population in all three countries are also provided with artificially fluorinated drinking water. Here's some uh, final thoughts by Brownstein. Lugol's iodine, you can get that on Amazon. Some Brownstein references here, some work cited that I did. You can send this to anyone who is interested in uh, learning more about this interesting topic. I'll pause my sharing, <laughs> open it up to questions. Can I can I come up with some big statement here? Uh, Please, Alasa, yes. I, I, yeah, I have a big statement here, and I think uh, you op just you open up a new can worm uh, that needs to be further investigated. And I will tell you why you open up a new can worm. Because mainstream medicine, they see iodine is uh, responsible for making tyroxine, and that's it. None of the mainstream medicine curriculums and things that we learn that the iodine is a cofactor of antioxidant enzymes. Iodine stimulate the expression of antioxidant enzymes. None of our uh, uh, curriculum and our study now now that that we we have in that iodine is is part of expression of antioxidant enzyme that's a big thing because i'm talking about superoxide dismutase catalase uh glutathione peroxidase and all those enzymes that makes those antioxidants in the body iodine does increase the expression of those uh, iodine also inhibit the prooxidants expression and prooxidants, um, all the signals of the prooxidant death, the, those the, the 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 KFB or whatever the those those prooxidant signals that increase the expression of the and the production of the free radicals, and so iodine also and have the Cox enzyme. None of our curriculums in the mainstream medicine, it works exactly like aspirin. Um, iodine helps increase the expression of nitric oxide synthase, so it improved the endothelial function test. Mm -hmm. And so, as you said, because of those halogens, which are equivalent to 
and they look like iodine, the, 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 the floor and the chlor and brome and all that. Mm -hmm. They are taking or replacing the iodines and they are inhibiting its natural effect. Yeah. And I think that's the reason that we, we need iodine extra because of all those halogenes are replacing the effect of it. So that's mean your COX enzymes are overactive. That's mean your prooxidants is overactive and your antioxidant enzymes are not expressed well because it's being blocked by blocking iodine. So that kind of shift of um, under, uh, from iodine being only to make thyroxine and that's it to, to iodine that is anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and also helps to improve the uh, expression of nitric oxide synthase and how this halogenes block the effect of iodines and replace it and leads to all of this problem. I think that's the reason you're getting all this uh, dramatic effect and very excited with your patients um, because you are restoring the function and the balance and the redox balance of the body, uh, which is being overlooked by the medical community. So I congratulate there you for doing that. But also, again, if you have too much of prooxidants and uh, you don't eat up too much of free radicals, yes, that will put the patient at risk of all kinds of cancer. And so it's not about just iodine deficiency, but also it's because of the poison itself of those halogenes blocking the iodine. You may patients taking iodine, but it's not functioning because you have the, the, the those ha halogenes are blocking its effect. So you need that extra amount to push those halogenes out from the sites where the iodine is producing their function. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, your dose is, is perfect. Uh, we need to learn from you exact dose needs to be done. Whether adding selenium, possibly selenium and iodine will help even because there is some concern about too much of iodine can cause uh, either hypothyroidism or, or hypo. It can cause thyroidites. That part, if maybe if we add NAC and selenium, maybe that would help to prevent that from happening and let the iodine to do the detox because it will shift or place, replace in, uh, those, uh, those, those brome and uh, fluor and chlor. But then also, and that's what the, the, the new things that you're opening here, we need to have a pharmacogenetics uh, to detect people who have problem with metabolism of iodine. And that is, we need to reach out to a lab, same like we did with vitamin D and B12. And so why, the iodine is, is, is essential. I mean, this was one of the first things that was created on earth. Um, I think it's integral towards our DNA that there should be no problem with iodine. No, the, what I'm saying is that the, the variations of uh, the, the, the genetics between one individual and another, they may have problem with absorption, um, mm -hmm. a problem of metabolism. There are genetic variations that happen from any ingredients in your body. Like we have variations in dealing with vitamin D from one person to another uh, and from other um, uh, nutrients. So we need to have some pharmacogenetics to tell, oh, this patient or this person has a problem of metabolizing iodine versus this person has a very good uh, absorption and metabolism of iodine. So you may get some genetic variation there where pe people with problem with metabolism genetically, they may need to have an extra iodine in their diet. But generally speaking, just because of the poison that we've been exposed in our modern life from this halogenes, which is affecting the antioxidant and anti-inflammatory, which is the redox balance, and also the immune, because you know it's it's a part of the immune redox and metabolic, because iodine is part of our body that we need to have. Um, so I think um, and 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 the shift and even preeclampsia, you said it's preventing preeclampsia and all that because of the again iodine helps to increase expression of endothelial of, uh, of the nitric oxide, so that's good for endothelial function and that's something. So what I'm just trying to say the mainstream medicine of um only iodine is for making tyroxine that's a that's a that's a problem but that's the mistake and people need to know that iodine is part of the redox medicine which is antioxidant also part of the immune system because it blocks the cox and all those things 
uh, and it balanced the immune system. Um, and, and that message uh, that we need to deliver it to, to the mainstream medicine and to the doctors here so they can understand that iodine is a cofactor of the immune function and also a cofactor for uh, redox medicine. You yes. got my point here? I do. And I, I think after watching this lecture and seeing all this case, these positive case studies that I've shown here, we can be a bit more emboldened to use higher doses of iodine because I know every one of you have been trained in school not to use iodine. We've been told all these, it's bad, bad, bad all the time for, for years now. Yeah, uh, the reason why they said that, because they in the mindset of the mainstream medicine, iodine is to make tyroxine and that's it. They don't know that iodine is a cofactor for expression of antioxidant enzyme, for superoxide dismutase, for increasing the glutathione's, for increasing reducing NAC, for, um, and also for inhibiting the prooxidant enzyme, the NFK beta. Uh, all of that is not, we don't have that's that that information right we know possibly selenium we know it's part of antioxidant but nobody is telling you iodine itself by itself it's an antioxidant in addition to its effect on expression of of the antioxidant enzyme inhibit inhibiting prooxidants and inhibiting cox enzyme hear about that and just by inhibiting cox enzyme you're decreasing um, the risk of having cancer because overactive cox and those prostaglandins is, is a source of the inflammation that leads to cancer that that kind of notion it's not in the mainstream medicine yet and so they don't see it as an antioxidant anti-inflammatory but now today we know and now we also need to find out if there's any problem who has pharmacogenetic have problem in the metabolism of iodine in the beginning genetically that they have high risk of uh having problem with with dealing with iodine and iodine is not functioning in their body and they need extra dose. true i've countered a couple of patients and i always thought it's because they need to detox a lot of bromide and fluoride so they need to go very low on the dose because they feel a little bit of detoxification and sometimes a lot of detoxification if they do too much iodine so for these patients with the high toxicity of fluoride bromide we do very low dose like one milligram we work our way up sometimes well, we can you can work on giving uh, um, activated charcoal and zeolite. Possibly they may help to collate those halogens yeah. along with iodine. But I'm just saying is that the in addition to the environmental factor, it could be also genetically they have problem with metabolism of iodine, with the absorption of iodokinetics, and that's the reason we need to reach out to the lab and tell them we need to know the pharmacogenetics of iodine for the patients. Uh, and so you will see the variation. Some of people are dealing with iodine very well, and some of them they don't, and they need extra dose. And doing that, that helps to personalize the, the medicine and understand that, you know, this patient may need more dose because in addition to his environmentally being poisoned by the halogenes, which blocks the iodine, but also he's genetically does not metabolize uh, 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 iodine and that gives them very interested in that test so far the best tests i can i found at individualized dosing is the iodine challenge test and until i have a better one that's the one i'm using yeah that's fine the iodine challenge test would be would be a, a, a good start yeah. and how often would you repeat that and how relevant is the 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 blood iodine test the blood iodine test i just did that to prove a concept um it's just you know tested 50 patients everybody was deficient i was like well everybody needs to be taking iodine and then i took it a step further with the iodine challenge test and i determined that but i don't always use the iodine challenge test. if the patient has an obvious iodine deficiency say they have fibrocystic breast disease per mammogram or thermography okay they're iodine deficient and you just treat them and you will see that they get better with the fibrocystic breast disease. Or you have a female with a painful menstruation or they have an endometriosis, they are estrogen dominant and you give them the iodine and you will see that their symptoms improve pretty rapidly, usually in about the first cycle they will notice it. Um, so I don't always use the testing, it's, it's just clinical uh, judgment as well.
And uh, if, we're, if we're monitoring, yes, yeah, so you can monitor the iodine challenge test again in three months to see how much are they excreting. Maybe they don't need such a high dose anymore. Um, but also you look at their symptoms. If they're improving too, you can lower the dose. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Siegel Thank asked, you. is there a safe dose of iodine to take if we don't test first? Yeah, I mean, everybody should be minimum three to 12 milligrams. And this is what the Japanese take, and they have less diseases of cancers. So we should all be taking at least three milligrams, if not 12. Um, I think, I know Dr. Pierre Cloutier, I don't know if he's here. He suggests most take 12 milligrams. Um, but, you know, I think play it safe, three milligrams, six milligrams minimum. You can get that if you eat enough iodine and seaweed, really. So if you eat enough seaweed, a couple cups of seaweed a day, which we in America are not doing. Uh, you know, you can eat a Japanese lifestyle if you want that, and uh, get the three six milligrams of iodine that way. If it makes you feel better. Okay. Um, what was the study in 1947 or 48 that 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 set iodine on the uh, on the road to uh, it's a poison? Did did you go over that? I didn't find out uh, how we got taught this nonsense in, in school. I mm -hmm. forget. Yeah, there were two scientists in uh, in uh, at Ber US, U UC Berkeley. Uh, and they, they injected rats with uh, radioactive iodine and then uh, extrapolated that to food grade iodine. There you go. That, that's that's kind of how it started. And at the same time, remember, that's the same time that uh, water was put in or fluoride was put in the water supply in 60 major U.S. cities. Ah, uh, of course, of course. And, and you know, I'll give to patients too. They're like, oh, I got an IV contrast study and I had you know, anaphylaxis to it or, or I had a bad outcome with it or my kidneys got all injured from it. I'm like, that's not the same thing. Not the same thing at all. Mm -hmm. You can test them. You can put iodine on their skin. They're like, look, I mean, you're not going to get kidney injury from iodine. We're talking about an iodine contrast, which is completely different. All right. Let me let me add something here about estrogen dominance. So that's one thing we need to consider. Uh, iodine it is aromatase inhibitor, and and so definitely this is part of supposedly part of estrogen dominance syndrome treatment, because once you inhibit the fat aromatase to prevent the conversion of testosterone to estrone, estrones, and we know the whole problem of of the obesity part of it is because of the excessive estrones that we have in our body. So knowing iodine is an aromatase inhibitor, that's that's a good thing for, um, you know, managing estrogen dominant syndrome. Mm -hmm. So, okay. And Dr. Chandler states uh, fluoride is dramatically reduces IQ in kids. So any any uh, comment on that? Yeah, I mean, fluoride itself has all sorts of problems for IQ, diabetes, but then it binds to the parts where iodine would have gotten to. So you're gonna have iodine deficiency, which we know causes cretinism in children, which is low IQ phenotype. Yeah, I mean, you need to have iodine in the childhood as part of the neuroplasticity of the brain. And with all this fluoride thing, it could be part of the autism. Yes. Uh, this brome and floor and all that, because iodine is very critical. Uh, yes. Not just for the thyroid. The people they focus on iodine is only for thyroid. You know. But the reality is that iodine is an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and it's part of the shaping the neuroplasticity of the brain. Um, and and so if you have something that hinders that or blocks that or replacing it with the uh, with this halogens that we are adding. Uh, as a disinfectant, because I think the reason why we're adding halogens because they are antimicrobial, right? Is that the reason? Uh, who knows why? What it's is the justification of adding brome and fluor with the water? It's antiseptic to kill the bacteria. The right? dentists, the dentists keep telling patients that it will improve their teeth. That's yeah, so it's 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 basically antimicrobial to kill the bacteria of the pain, of the mouth, but that can be uh, replaced with methylene blue and you know. At least it's more safer than um, than the fluor and chlor. Mm. Yeah, yeah. The kids need it. It'll help them grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, um, so what do you say? What do you say to the dentist now that the, uh, you know, we, 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 you know, I, it, I go it, to dentist. I go to a dentist that knows better. Yeah, they can they can they can treat gingivitis and uh, with metalum blue. The uh, Germans they really do it. Uh, they they put the metalum blue and they shine the red light, and it helps to you know kill things and um, prevent the caries and gingivitis. I think that will be a replacement and possibly iodine itself. It's it's better than fluor and chlor. They just give the patients uh, maybe mouthwash of Mm -hmm. some percentage of iodine well, as long as it's not toxic dose you're talking about you don't want to give toxic dose of iodine make sure patient is taking selenium and NAC yeah to to anything. plenty of water yeah right Dr. Chandler do you have anything to add Doc, you know Dr. Chandler's our uh, biological dentist he's on there um yes can you hear me yes mm -hmm. there we go um, I was just going to agree with all of that. The, they say that the fluoride helps bind the calcium more tightly so that the teeth don't break down as easily, um, which may be true. It, it, is, it is somewhat true. Um, however, for the side effects and the health risk, it's, it's not even close to worth it, obviously. Um, but that stuff's just some of the most toxic things you can do to people, calcification of the pineal gland. Um, I, I think it has a lot to do also, the, you know, the fluorine and bromine and all these and how much toxicity is building up in the brain from the mercury filling. I think there's a big correlation between, you know, those halogens and the mercury fillings helping bind into that fatty tissue in the brain. So. I don't know. Bad, bad stuff. Stay away from it. I, I think just add if, if you are a dentist, you can use Metalum Blue. and uh, does not stain the teeth, by the way. And you can shine the red light. And, and you can even help to increase the qualification of patient to do even dental implants. Because one of the problems with dental implants is that they end up with gingivitis and, and they fail. With the and titanium, so, if yeah. they do metalum blue photodynamic therapy, that helps them to qualify to do dental implants. Plus, continue doing it; uh, it does prevent the gingivitis from happening. Well, and a big part of that is that most dental implants are done with titanium, which heat up about five degrees Celsius when you're on your cell phone, um, literally cooking the endothelial junction of the tissue and cooking the bone around the implant. We're wow. starting to see a lot of bone loss and failures around implants since we've gone to 4G, 5G cell phones. Whoa. And now there's some animal studies showing that it literally just heats the bone up four to five degrees Celsius. They put um, that in people's backs and hips too, the titanium. Yeah, which that's a lot farther from the brain. And well, they put so their phone in their butt. They put it right there in there. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, good point. On the yeah, we just use the ceramic implants. The tissue stays beautiful around the ceramic implants. Um, you just don't see the gingivitis around the ceramic implants hardly ever. It's pretty hard. Yeah, we developed, if you're a dentist, it, it, Mike Beamer has uh, oral liquid metalum blue and also a piece of red light. Maybe that would help you in your, in your work if you're doing any implants or any dental work yeah, for gingivitis. Yeah, lots of implants. We've, we've done a lot of work and done some research with, with a nano silver out of Canada that I think I talk a little bit about here that's actually FDA approved. So it's the only silver on the market that you can tell your patients they can ingest internally and not worry about if something comes up that your head's on the chopping block. Um, and so that's what we're using in all of our equipment, putting all of our patients yeah. on it. But uh, we do before and after bacteria tests and in 30 days, it'll dramatically change the flora in the mouth. If, if you're talking about safety profile, uh, we don't know about the pharmacokinetics of silver. Uh, it may deposit in the body, and the body cannot get rid from it. I I prefer metal and blue um, photodynamic therapy uh, because you can get rid from all the metal and blue and the urine, and the safety of it is way high than mm -hmm. uh, mineral nanoparticle like silver and gold. Because I used to do silver also. 
but there is some questions about whether the body is getting rid from it or it's depositing the kidneys and things like that. Um, and I find the efficacy of combining light with Meclan Blue is way, way higher than any other method and it's more biologically friendly than any other way of, of doing it. So you maybe consider that. Uh, Mike Beamer sure. is not here. He's a pharmacist. Uh, he moved from Amex to Wells Pharmacy. Um, something you may consider working with him because he has those little device for, for, the, for the red light. Yeah. Designed in the beginning for the dentist, <laughs> but then when COVID hit, um, we shifted to to for the COVID patients, and we got very good success. But the beginning of it was the idea is to treat halitosis, gingivitis, and uh, help to prevent the um, gingivitis after um, mm -hmm. after dental implants. Hi, Doctor Clearfield. Yes, Doctor Gerber. Doctor Clear. Yeah, those two researchers from Berkeley were uh, uh, Drs. Wolf and Chaikoff. That's right. It was yes. the Chaikoff escape effect. Okay. I, well, if you take too much iodine, you'll excrete way more. This was later debunked uh, uh, in many studies uh, in the uh, uh, 90s. So that Wolf Chaikoff escape effect. Uh, my, 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 my Alzheimer's is kicking in. All I can think of was Clower and Piven. Piven Clower, which is a political thing, so, but <clears throat> sort of the same earth kind of earthquake. So, um, so can we get safe with 10 milligram of iodine for everybody here in this room? Uh, can we go that safe or is that safe 10 milligram daily? Okay. Dr. Pierre Cloutier suggests 12 milligrams for everyone. Uh, he wrote a very good book you guys should read. It's called uh, Dr. Halasa, there is a 12.5 milligram capsules available. Yeah. And so Saptomax so has that. And I think Claire uh, Lab uh, is is distributing it. So so it is very good. Um, and if you <coughs> if you are concerned about just tell patients to take four days a week or five days a week. So the total amount of ingestion per week can be reduced. Number two, methylene blue, when you give, you have to be very careful about the concentration because at the higher concentration, it does uh, stain teeth. But at lower concentration, it doesn't. And then there are low intensity lasers, uh, red light 660 uh, wavelength is available but it does not really get rid of the infection in the teeth like root canal or the uh, tooth implant. But if you use the, the high energy, there, is, there are some high energy um, lasers are available. And you, if you use that constantly every day for, for two, uh, two to three weeks, um, most of the infection goes away, and there are there are multiple dentists are practicing in our area. So, so this is important information. Okay, uh, one last. Yeah, time. there's a little laser called Usui, and that's like two hundred bucks on Amazon. That has three different wavelengths of light, goes all the way up to, to like 900, 850, something like that, um, as well as the, the lower wavelengths. Um, they have one with a little intraoral tip that's curved. You can get it right into, you know, around the teeth or implant. Um, U S U I E is the name of it. Um, it's a great little laser for the, for the price point, especially. Um, a lot of times you can find it on Amazon even, but that is it's just like one to two minutes with the with the tip it's it's concentrated so it's less time but that's a fantastic one that covers you know two to three different wavelengths of light depending on which laser you get is that a, um, a cold laser uh no it's a, it's a hot laser it gets a little bit warm um the three wavelength light that has the little tip um it doesn't quite get warm enough to be uncomfortable but you know it's generating a little bit of heat um to get the cold laser we usually have to go clear up to you know 2000 to 10,000 on the wavelength which is 
mm-hmm. you know, ten thousand, a hundred thousand dollar laser. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay oh, so one I, more question. Well, I got, it. I've got three daughter-in-laws who are pregnant, and I had heard years ago from Brownstein and uh, I don't know Flores or Sanchez, some some other guy back there. I can't remember his name. Um, about iodine and pregnancy and, and how much you can have these super high IQ kids. Um, that, that guy had, you know, like, a, well, a good number of genius level IQ kids over 20 years in his practice using this iodine. Um, I've got three daughter-in-laws pregnant right now. Would you generally accept that it's safe, going back to the previous discussion, that the 12 and a half milligram you know, pills that you can that you can just get online should be more than safe enough. They're all super healthy otherwise. Yeah, get some iodorel, twelve milligram. Okay, there's a okay, there's a question. Can you paint iodine near the prostate and get the same results? Okay. Yeah. I just bought them all a bunch and have been trying to get them to take it, but I will renew my efforts but one of my daughter-in-laws had read something online that iodine could be dangerous when you're pregnant and that she was nervous to take it and i was like that, that's not everything that i've heard about it i think it's one of the best things you can do so no if, it seems to prevent the, the preeclampsia can't hear you it it prevents the preeclampsia iodine you're muted Am I, i'm not muted no no we can hear you I am not good. Yeah, it prevents free. I can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Dr. Scott, he's going to type the answer in the chat. Yeah, I heard that. That's amazing. I would, I would, I, for pregnant and women, my, I, I would do, two, I would do um, a challenge test if I My two daughters are, both suffer from terrible uh, cramping and pain with periods. So I'm excited to get them started on it as well for that. Good. All right. And can you paint it on the prostate? I've never had a patient do that, but it has worked in other areas. We've used it primarily in women for mastitis, for ovarian cyst pain, for fibrocystic breast disease. You might be muted. I can't hear you. It works transdermally. Okay. Um, I hear him fine. Uh, I hear you fine, Stefan. Uh, So do I. I, I have no idea why you can't hear Stefan. Yeah. So, can you hear us, Stefan? Yeah. Okay. Um, can you hear us? Can you hear us, Doctor Scott? You may have muted everybody. Uh, looks like he dropped off. So. So let me let me add something about um, yes. people with uh, taking iodine and they end up possibly being poisoned from from shifting of the fluoride from their blocking sites which is the toxic sites um they can use zeolite zeolite is a chelation is the best chelation for um halogenes in general but specifically for fluoride so i think we need to recommend giving selenium nac zeolite along with iodine 10 milligrams just to be in a safe side to um, because you don't want to have those toxins and the body uh, of fluoride floating freely there. Uh, it may affect the kidneys. Yes. So uh, zeolite, selenium, NAC, iodine, we can create a capsule of that and 10 milligram or 12 milligram, even 10 milligrams the same. And that would be kind of regime for everybody um to make sure that you know we we cover it from all different direction vitamin c as well great antioxidants Please. but you cannot get zeolite with the minerals because it will bind the minerals so you have to separate that so i mean you know it, it's very good idea to to say you can use this this and this but you everyone should take home message that zeolite is going to bind to whatever molecules and particularly minerals has a great attraction. So, so don't give that, keep at least two hours away from, from your nutrients. Yeah. Uh, 
Stefan, before, before we uh, go, can you uh, just go over the uh, iodine challenge test once more, you know, where, where you get it done, how it's done? Yeah, you can get it done, uh, doctor's data. It's on Rupa Health, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. They have the urine halides. It's a, is it a 24 hour urine? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's called, I'll copy it in. I have the tab open here. If you search on Rupa Health, it's called urine halides pre and post loading combo. You got to get them the 50 milligram iodorol too. Okay. Come separate. Okay. Great. Okay. And, uh, okay. And so what, what do you, so you got that data and it shows that they have, uh, iodine suppression. So, um, it shows how much iodine they hold on to. Right. Mm -hmm. So say I give Dr. Clearfield 50 milligram iodorol tablet. He does the challenge test. The next day, he excretes 50% uh, or he held on to uh, 25 milligrams of his iodine. Okay. And is, is there a dosing uh, schedule from that? Correct. Right. So mm -hmm. if you held on to 50%, that means that you need 25 milligrams if you took a 50 milligram iodorol tablet. Okay, I can hear the screaming now from uh, the patients go to their other doctors and, you know, that we're going to kill them. <laughs> so how do we answer that? Well, yeah, or we get it now when I get when I give them uh, uh, the, the, the uh, what's the one we use, Joe, the uh, not designs for health, the uh, pure encapsulation has 170, I think it has 150 micrograms. Right, that, right. That's a drop in the bucket. Here's my I, slides. I, I realize that. So. <laughs> I've so, never had a problem with so far with one dose of 50 milligrams iodine. Mm -hmm. I think my dad, he had a little bit of a, a kidney pain from doing that, but that was because he was excreting about nine milligrams of bromide through that process. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, after that, we tried to detox him, but he has to go very slowly on the iodine. He's someone who cannot take more than like two milligrams, He's very sensitive to it. He's working his way up. It's a pure encapsulations, 225 um, micrograms. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. what Marlene was asking, is potassium iodine good? So the iodorel comes with both, potassium iodine, iodide, and iodine. It comes together, this two. Amen. Yeah. Okay, great. You're together in room. Both. Yeah. Yeah, I know that, that this thing popped up. It says view together in room. We're still learning how to use this thing, so I'm not sure what that <laughs> is. Once know. you do the challenge test, it should not be a problem about giving uh, giving the iodine because you have proven that patient is deficient. Mm -hmm. So so no matter what, whatever you, you tell the patient that it is you are deficient and this is confirmed through the testing and you will need it and usually do you repeat the test in three months or what uh, or you don't yeah three months you can repeat the test but usually i'll have them do a higher dose for a time and then at three months i'll probably back off on the dose because we figure they're saturated but you'll find that some patients they will tell you they need more and they feel better when they're taking more and so we dose it based off how they feel Like we do it everything. Right. All right, great. Okay, anybody else have any comments or questions? So, Stefan, thank you so much. Um, any any summary, little wrap up here? Could I ask a quick question? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Is there an advantage to having both forms of the iodine and iodine, or does it matter? Will they both become bioavailable? No, you need both. Iodine and iodide. This was compounded hundreds of years ago when compounding pharmacies would make this thing and they would compound it both together. Okay, because Designs for Health has one that is just a potassium iodide. Uh, no, you need the elemental iodine, iodine, and then you need potassium iodide as well. Okay, why is you. that? I mean, what what's the reason behind it? I mean, what why? I mean, potassium iodine. 10 milligram and that's it. Why we have to have the iodine? 
Why is an eight or whatever? Uh, let's see if I have a slide for that. And I'm pretty sure Brownstein would answer that also if you uh, look it up. That is somewhere in his book. Right. Uh, so potassium iodide is recommended for the treatment of radiation poisoning. Um, and then potassium iodide. And we have a lot of electromagnetic radiation right now that a lot of people aren't aware of or don't want to listen to. But we are getting radiated, to say the least. Yes. I think this is based off some studies. Like this one study, if you go down to slide 23 on the, the 4,000 patient years study, they used a 2% leucal solution. And they found that this one worked best to improve the fibrocystic breast disease. Um, why was it? Did they under, I don't know if they elucidated a mechanism of why this is the case. Yes, we're trying to be more economically efficient. If there's no much difference that's not significant enough, we just create and recommend adding 10 milligram even in the weight loss capsule. The study has showed that 70% of the subjects treated with sodium iodide had clinical improvement in their breast tissue, but the rate of side effects was high. 40% of patients treated with protein-bound iodide had clinical improvement, and 74% of patients in the crossover series had clinical improvement. Uh, let's see. So you're talking about sodium iodine is better or potassium iodine? It looks like they had best results when um, they did the 2% leucal solution, which is both potassium iodide and iodine. Iodine means that with the gluconate, is that what we're saying? What is the mix? Yeah, I believe there's a little bit of uh, a gluconate in the... the so iodine, gluconate plus iodine, potassium? Yep. Okay, how much uh, iodine gluconate versus what's the ratio? This is an old formula. Um, let me look it up. Jim Crow's. It's called the Jim Crow's. Jim Crow's Lugol's iodine. It's called glucose iodine? No, it's called Jim Crow's. It's one of the oldest. Okay, what is it made from? Let me see here. Because I'm going to add it to... Um, to the weight loss capsule that we create. Yeah, Ten can, down, not do. This one's a liquid solution. It all the Lugals is a liquid solution. Is that gluconate iodine? What is it? Mm. Iodine iodinate? What is iodinate is with with what? It might be proprietary. Yeah, maybe it's just proprietary thing. It has to do with absorption, but yeah. it, maybe there's no much significant difference. And if there's not, we just make it easy for the compounding pharmacy because you know you're sourcing different two things. Uh, sourcing one is more cheaper than sourcing two. Uh huh. It's made with distilled pure spring water. Okay. Iodine with distilled water. Yeah, spring water. But isn't there? There's no salt there. No, this is the solution that's uh, iodide, potassium iodide. Okay. Uh, so total iodine plus iodide is two point five plus three point seven five equals six point two five milligrams in two drops. Yeah, I think it's. I don't think it's significant difference between potassium iodide and this is just more of maybe absorption or something. Yeah. Yeah. I take oh. it every day. That's what I do. What is that? I take in the tablet because once you get beyond six drops, it tastes too much like a pool water. Now we're going to put 10 milligrams in the capsule of the weight loss. Yeah, you can do that. Sodium, uh, potassium, iodine, right? Not sodium, potassium. Yeah, do both. Put it in the capsule. It'll be good for weight loss. Okay. Stephen, anybody has used it post mastectomy on the chest wall uh, to prevent the recurrence maybe uh, once every a week or once every two weeks, three weeks, four weeks? Yes, uh, I had a lady with uh, old mastectomy. That was the case study from 98. 
uh -huh. she would get hurt on the iodine now. She takes it preventatively. But not to put like somebody, uh, if we had a radiation, I have a patient with the radiation and post radiation, she had some burns and that has healed. But uh, there is some degree of pain or some not, I mean, one to two out of 10. So something like uh, iodine paint on that uh, part of the chest, would that help with the pain? Skin is burned, no, because it would burn. It, it, it's a, it's strong antimicrobial, and it can be harsh on a burn. It, it stings. It's used as uh, and it inhibits wound healing. I always taught in my surgical rotations never to put iodine in the wound, the surgical wound itself, because it delays the healing of the tissues. No, no, it is it is already healed, and it's like past few years, but. Uh, uh, but she's still concerned that there's some degree because sometimes it follows the fibrosis, right? So sometimes they have a, some pain sensations and she's afraid because then they tell that, oh, you don't have a clear margin. So that's why they give them radiation. After radiation, then they, they have a post-radiation burn and, and second degree burn. So... Why doesn't she just take it orally? That that would be good, but I mean, it would be if she has a pain there and if there's a scar, wouldn't you think that uh, the local application would help? Mm. Like in a in a fibrocystic disease, uh, Alan Gabby and all they suggested that to paint the breast with the with the iodine. Oh, she has iodine. Breast, yes, paint it on the breast tissue itself. Yeah. But also take it orally. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> Good. Who else do we have here? Is that it? I guess that, yeah, well. Well, yeah. adding, adding, this is very important because the we have a lot of polycystic ovarian syndrome trend is, is raising up like crazy. And I think part of it is, uh, we don't say iodine deficiency, but also because of the toxic of the halogenes, which was shifting and replacing the iodine. So that will be something you add in your protocol to manage polycystic ovarian syndrome is to give iodine as an estrogen, as an aromatase inhibitor. Yes. Um, so something you may, we may need to consider it for managing polycystic ovarian syndrome. Oh, yeah. Hey, Stefan. Besides uh, seaweed, what do you think are the top foods or liquids that add iodine and iodides into our uh, diet? It's not an American diet. Yeah. Okay. I really don't know how you get it into the diet unless because you're taking it exogenously. I mean, That's why it's with the salt, right? The bottom feeders of the ocean to try to get it, like shellfish. Like... Right. right. Not necessarily. They're good, but I wouldn't eat them as a source of iodine. I just have them as like a fun treat sometimes. That's why they added it in the first place, because we really couldn't get it from food. Makes sense. Yeah. And patients ask me, should I eat table salt? Because it has iodine in there. Like, yeah, table salt has some problems associated with it too. Amen. Agreed. Just stick with the Celtic sea salt and take some iodorol. Very right. simple. So there is, uh, Steve here says uh, you took 12 milligrams of uh, uh, iodine a few times a week and his levels went up to 2650. So you're measuring serum levels. So after you start taking iodine, don't measure serum levels. There's not, there's no way to assess iodine status. The serum marker is just a marker of whether you took the supplement in the day before. If you really want to assess your nutritional status, you need white blood cell assessment of your nutrients. Uh, I just did this on myself last month with Vibrant America. It's a fantastic lab assessment to check your nutritional content of the cells. And the white blood cell obviously is a one month average of your nutritional content. Okay. The urine test you did, okay. okay. Well, uh, it's a urine test. 
the urine chest tells you two six five zero what was it milligrams per deciliter was it <clears throat> was it the doctor's data test was it lab core quest like who he's checking while he's checking um dr burgess had a question on trace minerals yeah just in general what's your because I think iodine is important, but I also think people die and animals die because they don't have trace minerals. What's your opinion? Yeah, I take some every day. I have a selenium with it from trace minerals, and I put that in my water, and it has a bunch of other trace minerals in there. I think it's great because all our water is depleted, and really we should be drinking depleted water essentially by proxy because it doesn't have fluoride and bromide in there. It's filtered. But you need to put the minerals back in there. So all my patients, they take element electrolytes, which is 1,000 milligrams sodium, 200 milligrams potassium, 60 milligrams magnesium. And they're drinking one or two of these throughout the day in their water. So they're putting electrolytes back in their water, which makes them you know, actually absorb it a bit better. Their cells perform a bit better. They're not swollen because they're not depleting themselves. They're not making themselves hypotonic. Right? They're normotonic. right? Uh, and then a bit of extra trace minerals just for it added benefit sure you did an iodine random urine 2625 again uh, that would be which uh, unit of uh, measurement um, so on doctor's data you know we'll get um, an assessment of milligrams over 24 hours so a patient who takes 50 milligrams of iodine you know, we check then how much of that iodine is less left in their urine excretion after 24 hours. This is a 24 hour assessment, not a random test either. And, and that's the way to assess it. That's the WHO way to assess it really. It's, it's 24 hour urinary excretion of, of iodine. What about our Hashimoto's patients in iodine? Is that have you seen that the issues with that no the hashimotos the the low thyroid you're talking about low thyroid from the immune system you know immune def, uh, defense. they need iodine and they need selenium as well and their thyroid function will improve okay the hashimotos is most likely um you know the, their, their low thyroid status is because lack of iodine and selenium over many years caused their thyroid to shut down well, you know, something triggered their immune system. That's, that's right. Yeah, probably the bromide in the bread products. That's why I think it might be triggering. Glyphosate and bromide hey, in the bread. The, 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 those of us who are old enough to remember, we had white bread delivered to our house, uh, two or I think three to two or three times a week. And the best part was the crust, right? That's where the bromide was. <laughs> that riots in the crust? Yeah, the bromide was in the crust and, and, uh, you know, I mean, it was soft white bread. It wasn't wasn't hard white bread, and uh, it was delivered. I remember it was delivered to our house when I was a little kid, and and uh, it, you know, it was fortified with you know, it was fortified with vitamins. <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, it was the best, the greatest thing. Well, it, it was sliced bread. That's that's what it was. That's where that expression came from. Amazing. Yeah, that's it's pretty. pretty toxic. On micrograms per liter as an iodine result. What if the the whole problem that AFRM suggests, they say the wheat is the problem with the thyroid. They say cut out the wheat. But I'm saying it's the wheat that's contaminated with the glyphosate and the bromide. Yes. It's the wheat that's been superheated and the amino acids are denatured. It's the wheat that's been genetically modified. It's no longer an ancient grain einkorn flour. This is probably what causes the, the Hashimoto's, the autoimmune thyroid, and all the autoimmune diseases. It's not the ancient grain itself. That's why people, when they go to... I think it's France, uh, Italy, other countries. They don't. They don't have the problems because they don't do that to their wheat. Uh huh. So, it, someone in the chat said it was two hundred sixty-two five micrograms. So, if you convert that to milligrams, it's only two point six milligrams you're excreting in the urine. Gotcha. So, not that much if you're taking twelve milligrams of iodine. That yeah. may mean that you're holding on to a decent amount, but I would still do. Not a random urine. I would do a 24-hour urine collection. Mm -hmm. Better. 
I remember way back when, when I first started, the uh, Terry Hertog had a, a lab in North Carolina that was doing 24 hour urines for um, iodine. It was the only place that you could get it done back then. And then that, that was his, uh, that was his uh, suggestion also. I don't know if they're still around, but you said Dr. Data's, Dr. Data has it, so it's easy to get to. Easy to get, or not root bowels or whatever, it's, it's easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I tried doing it with Quest. I tried doing it with, and it just can't make sense of the results. So, I know. Okay, um, so it, Steve has the range. They have there is 34 to 523, so. Uh-huh. Well, so, I'm not sure. So, um, give us a little summary, Steve. Uh, just wrap wrap things basically, up. Basically, everybody is iodine deficient, especially women, and they will tell you if they tell you they have painful breast, painful menstruation, if they have painful periods. Um, this is clear iodine deficiency. You do not even need to test them. You give them iodine immediately. And you will see within one cycle is their symptoms go away. Their painful breast goes away. They don't have painful cramps. Uh, their period starts getting regulated again. Uh, and you'll see this quite easy. In men, it's more difficult. They don't tell you so much. But you'll notice if you give them back iodine and you give them back some nutrients, their brain fog lifts. They have more energy. They're, they're finally able to focus at work. So their cognition improves when you give them iodine. So when I give them progesterone, I've been doing it wrong all, all these years. No, it's fine to give them progesterone, but uh, you know, the reason that they have probably low progesterone and high estrogen is iodine deficiency. They're all different. Okay, got it. Okay. Yeah. All right, um, anybody else have any comments or questions? John, are you still on? I don't see you on here. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. As yeah, always, thanks, Stephen. Um, I hope this was worthwhile. This was our first foray here on 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 this forum. Um, th there'll be some growing pains, you know, as as we uh, but we'll, we'll get used to it. Uh, hopefully, we'll grow um, grow with the A four M and the the health forum. Uh, uh, next week, we have um, Catherine Sumner is going to be back with us. She's from uh, 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 the uh, micro uh, uh, megaspore people. What is it? Microbiome labs, and Good. she's going to review in depth their their microbiome test. And we're going to do it from from uh, you know start to finish, and so hopefully by the end of our session, we're all very well um, schooled in how to interpret it because it can be quite it can be quite challenging. I want the challenging one. I've looked at a few of those. That's yeah. Hard. Yeah. So, so that's next week. Um, and um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to grow our channel here. And uh, uh, everybody, like I've said, bring one person. And we'll, we'll double our census. And I, I think as time goes on, um, we got uh, we got some pretty good um, exposure late uh, on the uh, uh forum.worldhealth.net um and uh that's um there's a there's a, a forum there you can we can ask questions and 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 get some answers uh, dr halas is on there i'm on there um and uh and uh yeah so and we still have the osrd.org the uh the video will go up on there um if we get the slides from stefan we'll put them up on there and yeah. um, uh, also on uh, somehow it, it I, I have I, I've somehow I've developed a, a YouTube channel that I didn't even know I had, had done. Um, it's Clearfield Medical Group, and the, the videos are showing up on there also. Um, so it's on there. There most of them are on YouTube. Uh, so um, if anybody has any comments or questions before we go, Stefan, a great job as always. Um, are you going to be next next month? I will be at the Dr. Farshian's um, conference, uh, 9th to 11th in Miami for the uh, American Academy of Stem Cell Physicians. I, I'm speaking on Sunday. I think Dr. Halas is speaking on Sunday. Um, so uh, if you're in the Miami area, um, let's um, let's uh, you know, let's meet up. Um, well, I'll put the uh, it's forum. Somebody asked what the, what it was. Forum dot 
World Health dot net. You can ask you can ask questions. You can answer questions. Uh, medical medical questions, uh, it, it, mostly on on you know the topics that we talk about, um, and um, it's uh, it, uh, there's like thirty five thousand uh, members there. Um, so um, thank you again, Stephen, uh, Stefan, uh, Robert Stewart says thank you. Great information. Um, I hope there weren't too many hitches here with uh, this uh, you know our platform tonight. We'll get better at it as time goes on. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll get it down uh, to a science like we had with the other one. Um, uh, John, anything, anything news from the medical school? Everything's 100% positive. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Th again, thank you, everybody. Anybody else have anything they want to say? You, got, you get the last word, Stefan, before you fall asleep there. <laughs> so give people iodine. Don't worry about it. Okay. There you go. There's your marching orders, everybody. Okay, so we'll, get, we'll get the video up as soon as we get it. And um, I'm going to thank you all for uh, being here. Um, Marty, I will um, check my schedule tomorrow. I'll, I'll give you a time. I think we'll be able to find some time, okay? So you're muted. So, okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, and um, everybody, uh, so Darla says that uh, great information. And, you know, we're always uh, grateful for Stefan when he, he's on. Again, next week, uh, Catherine Sumner from the Microbiome Labs, and we are going to learn how to uh, interpret the uh, microbiome test that they have uh, in, in depth. So with that, I'm going to say good night to everybody.